welcome. Uh, my name is Leslie Kirk, and I'm a member of the Classics Department, and it's my duty and pleasure to introduce Josh Ober for a second Sather lecture. Now, last time, in the introduction to the first lecture, you got a brief summary of Josh Ober's CV. What I want to do today is to talk more about the, the specific project, the importance, and the impact of Josh's work. What I would say characterizes all of Josh's work are three things. Number one, the coherence of his project over a whole career. Number two, the interdisciplinarity and rich productive engagement with various different kinds of theory. And finally, number three, the genuine political commitment that informs all his work. I think that of this as the praxis that goes along with the theory. The relevance of his work explicitly articulated for thinking and acting as citizens of a democracy today. Since the mid-1980s, Josh has been working through several central questions. Why was ancient Athenian democracy in general so remarkably stable through most of the 5th and 4th centuries BCE? And do we have to accept the iron law of oligarchy that in all societies throughout history, whatever the form of constitution, elites really rule? Or does the evidence for Athens rather support the view that democratic ideology was, in fact, hegemonic? And if this is the case, how was democratic ideology forged and propagated? And finally, what then does the laboratory of ancient Athenian democracy have to teach us that might be useful for modern democracy? I'm going to single out two relatively early books that are important milestones in this project. In his 1989 book, Mass and Elite in Democratic Athens, Josh focused on the large corpus of speeches of the Attic orators as a form of public communication that allows us to see directly the forging of democratic ideology and the ongoing negotiation of mass and elite interests achieved through discourse, as elite litigants argued their cases before large popular juries. In 1998, Josh expanded the scope of the inquiry with political dissent in Democratic Athens. Charting the dialectical interaction of pragmatic democratic ideology in action and his theoretical critique in the writings of a set of Greek intellectuals, Thucydides, Plato, Isocrates, and Aristotle, among others. Here, Josh argued strongly for the diversity and complexity of ancient Athenian society, in which we could see intellectual critics as one strand of resistance to democratic hegemony, but we could also track Athenian strategies of going on together figuring out how to sustain over time a democracy in a diverse society that had only thin coherence. It's hard to appreciate in retrospect the huge revolutionary impact this work had in the 1980s and 1990s. Especially in the beginning, in the 1980s, the disciplinary divisions between Greek history, Greek literature, and Greek archaeology were, in general, much more rigid. And much of the field was also resistant to engagement with theory and models drawn from outside of classics. So it was incredibly exciting for me as a young scholar of Greek literature to read a Greek historian who ranged fearlessly across all of these subdisciplines and, was, and who was happily using, for example, Foucault ideological analysis and speech act theory. More than that, Josh's specific model of reading rhetoric as a space for negotiation of mass elite interests was influential for my own thinking about the cultural and political work performed by Pindaric Epinician in performance. Finally, Josh's explicit acknowledgement of the normative aspects of his project, the importance of our careful, respectful study of the ancient world for thinking and acting in the modern world, endowed the whole project with urgency, now more than ever, I would say. So let me end with what strikes me as an exemplary anecdote. I first met Josh in 1989, when Carol Doherty and I recruited him to speak at a conference we were co-organizing at Wellesley College in 1990. At that conference, Josh gave a brilliant talk, reconceptualizing the Athenian Revolution of 5087 BCE as a leaderless mass uprising against Spartan interference, comparable to something like the storming of the Bastille at the beginning of the French Revolution. This was very much in contrast to the traditional account of the Athenian Revolution as led by a single great man, Cleisthenes, an account that owes more to wishful thinking than to the evidence, since as Josh pointed out at that time, our earliest best source, Herodotus, tells us that Cleisthenes was actually in exile at the time. When Josh finished his talk, a very senior classicist sitting in the audience, the former Regis Professor of Greek at Oxford, retired now to Wellesley, stood up in the front row, 
and rather than addressing a question to Josh, <laughs> turn around and in a state that could only be called apoplectic, <laughs> began haranguing the audience at large, <laughs> admonishing them not to be seduced into believing the pernicious <laughs> argument that the elite Pleisthenes was not the mastermind behind the birth of Greek democracy. I still have a vivid memory of Josh, clearly visible behind this fulminating professor, since after all, Josh was about twice as tall, uh, holding his talk text over his, up over his nose and mouth like this, <laughs> so the audience couldn't see his face and his reaction. But what Josh couldn't conceal were his eyes and his incredibly mobile eyebrows, which made it clear that he was laughing delightedly at this enactment of old versus young, great man history versus a model of popular action, and scholarly authoritarianism versus democratic knowledge. So please welcome Josh Ober for his second Sather lecture. Thank you, Leslie. That is one of my favorite moments, as, as I think you know. Um, uh, and uh, what Leslie didn't tell you um, uh, is that after that, um, uh, we repaired um, to uh, Carol Dougherty's uh, apartment, I think it was at the time, um, uh, and toasted the future. Um, and so this is, in a sense, the future. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, for those of you who were here last time, um, you will recognize this slide. I promise you this is not just the same lecture um, all over again, but for those of you who weren't um, uh, and those of you who um, uh, uh, don't have the whole of the previous lecture just in your head, um, we just start out with this quote um, uh, from uh, Socrates, according to Xenophon in the memorabilia. I think that all persons choose out of what is available to them what they think is most advantageous to themselves, and they do this. So I suggested um, last time uh, that this is a succinct statement of a background, what I called a folk theory, that is a theory that has no single author, um, uh, but is pervasive, um, at least within an intellectual community, uh, a folk theory of instrumental rationality. So the account is universal, concerns choice based on beliefs made under conditions of constraint, aimed at maximization of advantage to the agent, and results in action. So I went on to suggest that um, uh, this is uh, a, a version of a theory that we hear in a particular version from Plato's Thrasymachus in the first book um, uh, of Plato's Republic, uh, Thrasymachus rejecting conventionalist versions of the folk theory um, that had claimed that it's in every individual's interest to obey the laws. Uh, Thrasymachus um, offers what I call the Thrasymachian version, um, uh, the strong know what they want, know how to get it. Um, normatively, they should satisfy their desires by taking what they want from the weak, and in terms of action, they do so. Um, which is at least comparable in some ways to that original Socratic statement, but obviously is a, um, uh, as it were, ferocious strengthening of it. Thrasymachus also um, uh, suggests an abstraction, that is the craftsman of self-interest will never err in his assessment of how best to pursue his own interest. So Thrasymachus is not talking about any particular agent, not even about himself, but an abstracted agent, um, one who never errs um, uh, and uh, unerringly decrees what is best for himself. Now, once again, I suggested that this first claim the will of the strong is always going to end up in the advantage of the strong, um, is refuted by Socrates, but the abstraction is not, which is um, important. Uh, Glaucon, in the second book of the Republic, comes in to, as it were, rescue Thrasymachus' argument, not because he likes it, but because he thought it wasn't well enough framed. Um, uh, Glaucon um, and his brother Adimantus then reformulate the argument that Thrasymachus um, had given and that he'd heard from Thrasymachus and a myriad of others, ergo the folk theory, the background. It doesn't have any particular author. There are a whole bunch of um, people who are using this theory and he does so in order to allow Socrates to demonstrate against the most 
difficult possible challenge, the best formulated version of this theory, um, that uh, uh, happiness um, of the just is superior to the unjust and that justice is an end to itself. Okay, so now we begin uh, the work of, uh, that I want to do today, and this is the first um, uh, number on your handout. If uh, you don't have a handout, I think there still are a few there, so um, uh, you, can, you can get one if you want. Um, anyway, so this is an important uh, quote. We're going to come back to it again and again. I'll read it through the first time completely, and after this, it'll just be little um, uh, uh, bits of it. So by nature they, that is ordinary Greeks, say to commit injustice is, for each individual, a good, and to suffer injustice is an evil, but that the excess of evil in suffering injustice is greater than the excess of good in doing it, so that when men do injustice and suffer it from one another and have experienced both, for those who lack the power at once to avoid the one and choose the other, that is, avoid injustice and choose um, uh, uh, and, and uh, choose the advantage, it seems profitable um, to make a compact with one another, neither to commit nor suffer injustice. And they say, these same background ordinary Greeks, that this is the beginning of the establishment of laws and covenants between men, and they name the command of the law the lawful and the just, and they say that this is the genesis and essential nature of justice in between the best, which is to do wrong with impunity, and the worst, which is to be wronged and be impotent to get one's revenge. So that's the origins of social order, right? That's the topic for today. That is how it begins, because um, uh, people choose this um, uh, because they can't uh, get um, a world in which they get to do injustice without being punished for it. Um, so uh, once again, going back to something we talked about last time, um, uh, Glaucon then sets up a thought experiment, two men on a path, one of them ostensibly just, one of them uh, explicitly unjust. Um, uh, and he says that we'll see most clearly that those who practice justice do so unwillingly and because they lack the power to do injustice if we construct something like this in thought. So this is a thought experiment. We grant to an ostensibly just man and an explicitly unjust man the freedom to do whatever they like. Um, then we can follow along seeing where desire, epithumia, leads each one of them. We should then catch the just man, self-revealed, going along to the same destination as the unjust man. It's important, going along to the same place. Um, uh, because, of striving, uh, because of the striving to gain more and more that every creature by its nature pursues as a good. Um, we then do the Glaucon thought experiment piece, um, come back um, to the two men, give them both invisibility rings so they can do whatever they want, um, uh, and provided with rings we see the um, perfectly unjust and the ostensibly just man behave in an identical manner, egoistically. Um, uh, their predicted behaviors is to act just as um, Gyges with the ring had acted, um, that is stealing goods, um, uh, having sex with whoever they want, um, uh, and doing all of the other things that would make them godlike. Um, uh, there's furthermore the abstraction that Thrasymachus had offered is carried over into Glaucon's experiment. Um, they are described as perfect craftsmen of um, self-interest. Um, they don't make any errors or they can easily correct their errors. Conclusion, once again, is underlined here. Both men will end up at exactly the same destination. That is, they make the same choices, so act just as Gyges had, um, maximizing subjective value, what they want according to the logic of Pleonexia. Okay, so I suggest that what I'm going to be arguing for here is we can move from the text of Plato's Republic um, to the construction of a kind of game. Um, so Plato's Glaucon presents our two instrumentally rational agents, each a perfect craftsman, so abstracted from ordinary uh, real people, who have traveled the same road, ended up in the same place. Um, the premise I ask you to at least entertain is that these two agents have full information about each other. They know that the other one is also a craftsman of self-interest. Each has to make a choice based on self-interest and the choices he thinks 
would be made by the other. They're at the same place, right? And they're going to have to make some decision um, in respect to um, the other person. The question then is what kind of society would be made by the choices of these people, right? So I, the notion is, is that Plato set this up, so we're able to think this way. Obviously, Plato doesn't set it up in exactly the way I'm going to go. I mean, doesn't follow through on what, I've, uh, what I'm going to go now. But the argument is, is he's made it pretty evident that we could do it. Two agents at the same place, each um, uh, perfectly rational in this instrumental sense. Um, so two men in a game, let's put them now, um, and this is on the back pages um, uh, after the text part. Um, uh, uh, this is, uh, and all of the other um, four box games are available to you. Uh, Glaucon's two rational agents then can be thought of as the players um, in a two-party strategic game. The way we play these kind of games um, is we imagine there are two players. One's the row player, always goes uh, first if it's a sequential game or uh, they go at the same time if it's a, uh, a, uh, that kind of game. And then uh, the second player is the, is the column player. Um, and so we have four possible pairs of choices, right? Um, uh, a, 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 B, B, A, B, B, right? So you just see how that goes. And then uh, based on the choices that each makes, we list the payoffs um, uh, uh, to each. Um, uh, the row player gets uh, his sort of to the left and, uh, and below, and they, and they pay off to the column players above and to the right. Um, OK, so um, that's the basic setup. Um, so what kind, of, what kind of game, if it is a game, are we playing? in Glaucon's account of the origins of social order, if we imagine that it is his two fully rational people who are going to model the beginning of social order. So that's, that's what we're doing. OK, so we go back to his text. Um, uh, and it says, by nature, they say, to commit justice is for each individual a good, and to suffer it is to e as an evil. This sounds rather like Thrasymachus, right? So let's put them into a Thrasymachus game. Um, now, in a Thrasymachus game, we might imagine uh, that one of the players um, uh, is uh, without a ring, say the column player, and one of the player, the row player, has a ring. Um, uh, and in this case, um, because uh, in a Thrasymachian world, you're always going to seek your advantage, completely um, ignoring the um, uh, concerns of the other, and you can get it. You're strong, right? Thrasymachus imagines that we're in a world in which the strong always get what they want, um, whether they have a ring, whether they're clever rhetoricians, um, uh, for whatever reason. Um, and so therefore, uh, the game is always going to end up down here. That is, the unjust man, um, the, the strong man, is always going to be able to take advantage of um, uh, the uh, other. Um, uh, and he's always the, so the person with the ring will always play injustice. The person with, uh, 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 without the ring is going to inadvertently play justice. Um, uh, and so therefore, um, the uh, equilibrium position is going to be here. Now, if we just reversed it, this guy had no ring, this guy um, has a ring, um, then we end up here. It's just, it's just a mirror image. You see how that goes. Okay. Um, so uh, that's what uh, the world Thrasymachus wants to live in, um, strong win, weak lose, and it's always the way it goes. Um, uh, so um, uh, what if, uh, however, uh, we're in a different kind of game as we go for, through the, um, the, uh, the passage here? Those who lack the power at once to avoid the one, um, uh, that is always getting to do injustice, um, uh, uh, or, or always um, uh, to avoid the one having, being the victim of injustice, rather, and choose the other, always doing injustice, uh, it seems it profitable to make a compact with one another, neither to commit nor suffer injustice. So what kind of a world would we have if we actually had such a compact? Well, we might have Aristotle's world. Um, Aristotle's world, say, um, in Book 7 um, of the Politics, uh, the polis of our prayers, so imagine that our two players, instead of now being Thrasymachians, um, are now Aristotelians. Um, and they're good Aristotelians. Um, that is, they believe in Aristotle's and they have fully internalized and they're going to act according to Aristotle's two compatible um, definitions of justice. 
On the one hand, it's equality. Um, that is, those who are equal in the relevant sense ought to receive equal shares of whatever good is being distributed, right? So equals relevantly get equal shares. Um, uh, and the second is the common good. Um, each individual that is a part of the whole community, our tiny community here of two people, but still part of a whole, um, ought to seek the advantage of the entire community rather than individual advantage, right? You want the best for the whole community. And this means that our, put these together, um, our unique equilibrium is going to be up here, um, uh, circled uh, three, three. Um, we can't have an unequal thing. We assume that both of these people are equally virtuous, right? They're citizens in the polis of our prayers. So we can't have unequal distribution. And we assume they want the best for their community. Um, this is less good for their community. We can figure out what's best for the community by just adding up the uh, uh, payoffs in this. This says one plus one is two. This three plus three is six better payoff, equal and better. And so Aristotle's going to say, that's the way it goes. Um, if you're in an Aristotelian community, that's going to be your um, uh, uh, equilibrium. Um, uh, so that would be nice, um, uh, but that's not the world that Glaucon's describing. Um, he's describing a frustrated preference for perfect injustice. They want it, and they can't get it. Um, uh, so um, the nature um, of uh, justice then um, uh, is in between the best, um, which is to do wrong with impunity, and the worst, which is to be wrong, to be impotent, to gain one's revenge. So where are we in Glaucon's story? I would suggest that we're at a prisoner's dilemma. Okay, and those of you who know game theory, now this is really a standard move in uh, uh, game theory, um, the prisoner's dilemma um, uh, famously um, uh, suggests that the dominant strategy that is the only strategy um, that will be used um, by fully rational players, right, rational in this self-interested kind of way, if they're also fully informed, they know they're playing against another fully rational player, so we're not in Thrasymachus um, uh, one has a ring, one doesn't world. Um, uh, the uh, dominant strategy is always to defect. It's always in your best interest to defect. That's because if Rho um, here uh, defects, uh, then uh, Column must defect or end up here and get the sucker's payoff of zero. See how that works? Um, and then if Rho cooperates, um, then Column must defect in order to get the highest possible payoff available to column um, uh, uh, for better than any other payoff there. So we must, in fact, defect. Both are in a perfectly equal position. Um, uh, therefore, uh, they will both defect. Um, and the result um, is a low payoff for each of them. Not the lowest possible payoff, which is zero, um, but to avoid that lowest payoff, they're each going to get the third best, um, uh, just second worst payoff of one apiece. And moreover, there's going to be a really low aggregate social payoff. We add up those boxes. Um, we end up down here in a kind of a crummy world of 1-1, uh, uh, one, one, um, uh, aggregate of 2, rather than the happy world. If only we were Aristotelians, we could be up there. We can't be because we're assuming full self-interest of these, of these players. At least that's what um, it seems to be set up in uh, uh, Glaucon's challenge. Um, so this is why it's a dilemma, right? It's a dilemma, and I'm calling it Glaucon's dilemma, because I think this is what he's setting up. It's something like a prisoner's dilemma. Um, it's a dilemma because each individual player is getting a pretty bad payoff, um, and that the society is getting, as it were, the worst available payoff, um, uh, and yet that is the dominant strategy. That's an equilibrium. There's no way out. That's not a happy thought. Um, indeed, uh, and uh, there is a whole literature on the unhappiness of this uh, thought. So the prisoner's dilemma is a standard game theory tool, as I suggested. It's frightening in its implications. If it's real, 
Um, we tend to push down to really bad payoffs individually and collectively, um, and it's frequently taught in economics. So in a really important book, um, uh, Sonia Amadai um, uh, argues that uh, when it is taught as a normative story, when the prisoner's dilemma is taught as what a truly rational individual should do, and you're irrational if you don't do this, um, it becomes, in a sense, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Students learn that in order to be rational, and you do want to be rational, don't you? Um, in order to be rational, you must be self-interested, untrusting, and uncooperative. Um, uh, and so Amadai suggests this is really a problem. Um, the reason it's such a good book is she doesn't say there's something wrong with the way the prisoner's dilemma is set up. Um, she, doesn't, she thinks it's actually a very robust result, but she thinks that um, teaching it um, as a normative approach is really a difficult thing. Um, Okay. Uh, so uh, the question is, is there some way out um, uh, of this uh, unpleasant um, uh, position? So perhaps experience will help get us out. Um, uh, so uh, once again, back to our passage, Glaucon says, the excess of evil in suffering and justice is greater than the excess of good in doing it, so that when men do injustice and suffer it from one another, and have experienced both, for those who lack the power, it seems profitable to make a compact with one another. Okay? Um, so this suggests as, that we're in a repeated game solution. Right? Um, Glaucon seems to suggest that each agent has played a mixed strategy, um, that is, has tried cooperation, and has experienced advantages from um, the other defect, um, uh, or has uh, experienced uh, uh, penalties for that, and has tried defecting, has um, uh, got gains out of that. Um, so a mixed strategy is basically the strategy you'd pay, you play, not by figuring out what your dominant strategy is, right, but by flipping a coin, right. So instead, you just go in and you say. All right, I'm going to decide whether to be cooperative or whether to defect just by flipping a coin. Um, but it sounds like there's been some coin flipping um, that went on, um, uh, and that uh, each has experienced both of the, um, uh, uh, the goods of, uh, of uh, defecting um, uh, when the other cooperates and the bads of cooperating when the other defects. The losses, according to Glaucon, outweigh the gains. Um, it's worse overall um, uh, as you um, lose than what you gain. So repeated play, whether it's mixed or dominant or some mix of mixed and dominant, um, is going to end up that everyone's going to be behind. And the more you play, the further behind you're going to get. Um, uh, so therefore, agreeing to cooperate is rational. Okay? There's a sort of hopeful thought of repeated play. Um, uh, if everyone does stick to the agreement, both of our players in our um, uh, very um, simple example, this is mutually beneficial, although it's not optimal for anyone. It's always optimal um, uh, to defect while the other um, cooperates. But everyone avoids the worst, that is the sucker's payoff, the zero payoff, um, and gets their second best payoff three if both cooperate, um, and the whole society gets its highest three three payoff. Um, now, the question then is, is can learning from the experience of both doing and suffering injustice lead the people in Glaucon's experiment to agree just among themselves, right, to, you know, here we are, maybe we're the two guys, or maybe we're a bunch of people, can we agree among ourselves to renounce injustice? Is everyone going to consistently choose to cooperate because we'd be better off if we did that. Okay. Thomas Hobbes says no. Uh, you can't do this on your own. Um, uh, the um, key work in 17th century uh, English social contract theory suggests, this is Leviathan, um, suggests that the problem of making a contract or a compact, an agreement, um, among self-interested individuals, people who are fearful of getting the worst payoff, um, who are trying to get their best payoff, cannot be solved without the agreement to create a lawless armed sovereign as a third party 
coercive enforcer. That's the big payoff for Leviathan. So it's a much more subtle argument than that, but that's where it comes down. And there's no Leviathan in Glaucon's story, right? It just seems to be an agreement among those people. So uh, Hobbes would say that's not the case. Um, now, I want to say that there is, in fact, hope for this repeated game story if we go into game theory. So game theory shows robustly that repeated game does allow for multiple equilibria. You can end up in various places um, uh, in this uh, uh, matrix, including cooperative outcomes. Okay, this is one of the standard results of uh, 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 repeated game theory. Um, but the question is how, given the perfect self-interest premise of our original agents, um, can a society make the transition from mutual defection, that prisoner's dilemma 1-1, one, one, to mutual cooperation, that 3-3? Three, three. The issue is um, that each individually rational self-interest, uh, interested individual, must avoid the sucker's payoff of suffering injustice during the transition. How do you bootstrap that kind of trust, right? So you're sitting around saying, be great if we could get there. You go first. You trust me. No, 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 you go first. No, I think you go first. Uh, nobody goes first. So boom, we're back down there in the bad corner of the prisoner's dilemma. There's a worry here that by solving it, by just saying, well, this is just how cooperation happens, that Glaucon um, has given us an example of an invalid teleological functionalist argument. That is an argument that takes the form, the eventual good result, mutual cooperation, is itself the cause of the necessary conditions, that is the individual choices that are going to be made by the agents, that is required to bring it about. So it's basically the future good is somehow imposing itself on the present actions. Um, uh, and that's just you know, standard um, uh, teleological functionalism, which is generally speaking thought of as invalid. So looking ahead to Plato, uh, Plato's Republic is going to end up with a Hobbesian type third party enforcer, or rather third party enforcer group, um, uh, to social order. We're going to have a authoritative philosopher kings who are going to be backed by the military caste of the guardians are going to bring about and sustain a harmonious cooperative order. So we can basically say that Plato in the end is going to go to not actually a guy who looks like Charles I and so on, but anyway, um, is going to basically have um, uh, a, uh, a, a Hobbes type solution. Um, so the question is, are there alternatives to Plato's Callipolis that um, allow us to get out of this? Because after all, the Callipolis is pretty expensive. Um, in fact, it may be simply impossible. Um, so did the Greek tradition of thinking about instrumental rationality imagine non-Hobbesian alternatives? Um, and the answer is, of course they did. Uh, uh, Aristotle is going to pipe up and say, well, you know, just stay tuned. Um, and in the politics, um, uh, I'll give you um, uh, natural sociability. Um, uh, and I'll just ask you to hold that thought um, if you return uh, uh, for the fourth lecture. But meanwhile, let's um, think about some things that don't require us to take on all of the apparatus of uh, uh, Aristotelian natural, uh, natural sociability. So let's go to a somewhat more obscure text, um, Diodorus Siculus, book one. I'm sure you all have it uh, uh, well in your heads. Um, uh, and uh, Diodorus says that, um, that he's just an example of these kinds of arguments, right? So um, there's a whole bunch of other ones that take this same basic form. Um, uh, since early humans were attacked by the wild beasts, they came to one another's aid being instructed by expediency, to sum feron, when gathered together in this way, by reason of their fear, they gradually came to recognize their mutual characteristics. Um, sort of a nice thought, but it doesn't give us a whole lot to work for, uh, work with. It doesn't give us um, uh, uh, really a mechanism. But Later in book one, Diodorus um, uh, does give us a more um, satisfying account. Um, uh, he suggests, talking about early social organization in Egypt, 
that when men first ceased living like the beasts and gathered into groups at the outset, they kept devouring each other and warring among themselves, the more powerful ever prevailing over the weaker. But later, when they were those who were deficient in strength, taught by expediency, again, grouped together and took for the device on their standard one of the animals that was later made sacred when those uh, who were from time to time in fear flocked to the standard, an organized body, a sistema, was form which was not to be despised by any who attacked it, and when everybody else did the same thing, the whole society came to be divided into organized bodies, into systemata. Okay? So what's going on? Um, well, he's thinking about something like this. Uh, so if you go to the uh, Temple of Horus at Edfu in Egypt, uh, you'll see this uh, uh, nice uh, uh, relief. Um, and th these are some guys who are holding um, these uh, standards, and they have animals on the top of them. This is Ptolemaic. I mean, I think this is about 2nd century BC. Almost surely Diodorus uh, uh, saw something like that. Probably not the relief, probably the procession itself. Um, my point is not where did Diodorus get his image, but in what way is an animal standard like Grand Central Station? Um, uh, and those of you who um, know uh, Thomas Schelling's work on focal points will see where I'm headed with this. Um, uh, Schelling famously solved the problem of coordination without communication and without any preset rules um, uh, by reference to what he called focal points, now sometimes called Schelling points because uh, of this uh, uh, importance of this result. Um, and a focal point can be any um, uh, commonly recognized symbol. So Schelling's example, he says that, ah, I've checked it out with, with, uh, with people in the local area, it all works out, um, uh, is that uh, imagine you're two friends and you agree that you're going to meet for lunch in New York City. You just forgot to say the time and you forgot to say the place. Um, what are you going to do? Um, and what Schelling says is you end up at the information booth at Grand Central Station because every New Yorker knows that you do that. And when do you meet? You meet at noon. Um, so that is a focal point that allows for coordinated action. Both people want the same thing. They want to get lunch. They want to meet their friend. They can do it now without any uh, need for coordination. So it's a very nice result, but it's a one-off solution among friends. Right? That's the key thing. Um, uh, so the question is then, how is a response to threat focal point based social order, if we think that's what Diodorus was driving at, sustained over time so that the social organization, the, you know, acting um, in systemata, uh, became dependable. So Diodorus stories are all concerning costly and repeated habitual cooperative behavior under very dangerous conditions, right? Wild animals and bad people. Um, uh, so what stops the rational individuals, assuming that we're talking about rational individuals here, from free riding? Um, why doesn't each of the individuals who's supposed to rally to the standard after the first time, and they say, oh, some people are getting hurt doing that. Um, uh, why don't they say, well, you know, just one less person around the standard probably wouldn't really make a difference. I bet the animals would still be beat off. And then the next person says, well, I have the same idea. And then you have a cascade of defection. Nobody rallies to the standard, and you're all eaten up by the animals or the bad people, whatever it is. Um, so what prevents that? Um, so we've got an option, but it seems still to have some issues. Um, uh, so let's go to uh, Plato's Protagoras. Um, uh, now, I'm going to, from here on in, just say Protagoras. Keep in mind that I mean Plato's Protagoras every time I say that. We really don't know what the real Protagoras you know, believed or said. Um, we know a few bits, but that's not relevant really here. Um, uh, so this is uh, Plato's Protagoras in his dialogue of the same name. Um, and in this story, Protagoras gives the, a great myth, he gives a big long speech uh, uh, in which he tells a story, fame, you know, well known I suppose to all of you, about how humans were brought into existence by divine fiat along with all of the other animals. 
Um, but the process was rather mishandled, living, leaving us humans um, without the natural capability of the other animals. We don't have big claws and teeth, and we can't run fast, and all of this stuff. We're pretty puny compared to uh, the animals. Um, and so to enable anim humans to survive, Prometheus, after all, he created us, um, uh, uh, stole fire and technology from the gods. Uh, and of course, famously was punished by Zeus, but we're not going to worry about Prometheus's punishment much anymore. The question is, if we just stop there in the myth, is technology enough? Um, is that going to solve the problem? And there are actually versions of these early social order things that basically say technology is the answer. Um, uh, but in Prometheus' story, it's not. Um, provided with technology, humans dwelt separately. Almost impossible to imagine, isn't it? Um, thus provided, humans dwelt separately in the beginning, and there were no polis. Um, so that they, the people were being destroyed by the wild beasts, uh, although their technical skill was sufficient, was a sufficient aid in respect to food. They could get food now. They could cook it with fire. Um, and their war warfare with the beasts, it was defective. Um, for as yet, they had no political craft. They had no politique techne, which includes the craft of war. So what did they do? They sought to band themselves together and secure their lives by founding polis. Yet as often as they were banded together, they did injustice to each other through the lack of the political craft, and thus they began to be scattered again and to perish, eaten up by the wild beasts. This guy's actually not being eaten by a tiger. He's a tiger trainer, I promise. It's not a, it's not a horrible um, vision. Um, OK. Um, uh, but. Uh, uh, then, of course, the next step in the story, if you know it, is that Zeus decides that to forestall human extinction, they're going to go extinct at this point. He commands that original human moral psychology, which seems to be something like Glaucon's moral psychology of the um, uh, unjust uh, man with a ring, the uh, original moral psychology should be augmented by distributing shame, idos, and a concern for justice, decay, among men, so that there would be order within poles and bonds of friendship to unite them, unite the people within them. Now, the new moral psychology, importantly, is to be offered to all. Um, Hermes says, well, to just, you know, some of them, uh, like the other crafts, um, no. Zeus orders that all pontes must share in it because poles cannot exist if only a few people have a share, as is the case with the other crafts. Then Zeus, importantly, decrees death as a public health hazard for anyone who is incapable of um, uh, sharing in shame and a sense of equity. So although it's distributed generally, Apparently, some people refuse or are somehow incapable of taking up the distribution, and those people are dangerous. Um, they are, in fact, contagiously dangerous, and they have to be um, uh, driven out or killed. Um, OK, so Protagoras then steps back from telling this myth. He's been telling it explicitly as a mythos. Now he moves to Logos, right? Said, all right, I'll tell you what this all means. Now that there is order in polis in a Greek community like Athens, he explicitly references Athens, if a man is known to be unjust and publicly admits to being unjust, this would be considered madness, uh, mania. And so everyone, they say, must claim to be just, whether he is or not. Whoever does not make some pretension to justice um, is indeed mad since it's necessary that all, without exception, share it in some way or another, or else not be of the human kind. Um, furthermore, he talks about education, and it's rational education. Um, our neighbor's justice and virtue, I take it, is profitable, right, um, for us. And consequently, we all willingly speak out and teach one another in matters of justice and lawfulness. So self-interest has not gone away. We have not created a community of saints here. We're doing this because it's in our own interests. Um, so part of the mutual uh, instruction is public punishment. 
wrongdoers um, uh, who do not respond to the correction that he suggests will be offered, to, you know, will punish in a corrective way, not in a retributive way. But those who don't uh, uh, respond to correction must be expelled from the polis um, uh, or put to death. Okay, so he's picking up on this Zeus thing, right? If you can't get with the program, at some point you got to be expelled from the society. Um, uh, so what I suggest here is what Protagoras has done is run a cooperation thought experiment twice, right? So he doesn't really suppose this is sequential. I mean, it's a muthos for heaven's sake. Um, he's basically saying, think about this in two ways. In the first run, we imagine humans as purely self-interested and therefore even with technology and in the face of existential threats, it's got the animals coming in as before, they fail to cooperate in ways that can bring about any kind of a stable order. So the equilibrium here, the, you know, where we're going to end up in that game is scatter and perish. We're going to be down in that bad um, uh, lower right-hand box um, uh, in the uh, Glaucons or the Prisoner's Dilemma. So that's that. that, is, that that's the first run um, uh, of the... Uh, of, the, of the experiment. But then he does it again. He says, all right, but suppose that humans had a different moral psychology, right? Suppose we're not just like that Glaucon um, claim. In the second run, um, let's assume a psychology in which self-interest is augmented by shame and justice. Um, and in this second run, humans remain rational. They don't, they're, they're still interested in, their, in, in themselves. But uh, now we see that because our neighbor's justice and virtue is beneficial to us, um, we choose to assume the cost of speaking out and instructing one another. We're no longer narrowly, egoistically self-interested. So we move then from a prisoner's dilemma to what is sometimes called a stag hunt. Um, uh, so payoffs for defecting when the other pay player cooperates now you know, up here. Um, uh, has been lowered from four to two in recognition of the new morality. Um, anyone with an internalized sense of shame bears an internal cost when she acts so as to outrage that sensibility. So maybe you do something really nasty, you, you defect, and you say, ha, I got my good payoff, but I'm a hateful person. Um, and so your good payoff isn't as good. Yeah, um, so it goes from four to two. Um, and once again, these numbers are just you know, assigned. You could, you, could, you could do them differently. Um, they just have to be in the right sort of general order. OK, so that's part of it. You've changed the psychology. But furthermore, we're in a repeated game. OK, we are in a repeated game here because we're going to keep on going and educating each other and so on. Re repeated games randomly pairing many players allow for agent-based modeling of populations that evolve over time. They change dynamically over time, um, and they can change ultimately into a stable equilibrium. So the really famous result here came in the 80s. This is Axelrod's um, uh, 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 original work on the tit-for-tat computer simulation model of evolution of cooperation, and lots and lots of work on this uh, ever since. So depending on which strategy each plays in these repeated games um, uh, and how the agents learn and how learning spreads, the population evolves in a process that in evolutionary theory is called replicator dynamics. So this just means that a, a replicator in evolutionary game theory or in biology is a strategy in a repeated game. So for example, conditional cooperation, such that I will cooperate with you next time if you cooperated with me this time, okay? Um, but it's conditional because if you defect on me this time, I'm gonna defect on you next time, right? Um, uh, so uh, if a strategy is successful, the replicator makes copies of itself, and if unsuccessful, it fails to make copies. And depending on the original distribution of the types, defector types or cooperative types in the population, one re replicator, for example, conditional cooperation, can dynamically, with repeat play, drive out another replicator. It can become the dominant form of 
behavior. Um, so Protagorean replicator dynamics, um, Protagoras mythic Zeus, you remember, realize that polis cannot exist with, if only a few people have a share in shame and justice. And um, this is true. Um, uh, when you do replicator dynamics, if you start with too few um, uh, in the population, it'll devolve into an all egoist and the equilibrium is just going to be scattering and perishing. Moreover, if each round of the repeated game is played as a standard prisoner's dilemma, the egoists are going to win and cooperators are going to lose. The point here is we need both shame and justice. Um, uh, if, per Protagoras on punishment, cooperation is conditional and the play is based on retaliation, um, so if you pay defect in round one against me, I play defect against you in round two. Um, and if punishment is meted out often enough, you're defecting in the next round is imagined as the punishment, then retaliation will eventually eliminate the egoists or lead them to change their play to cooperation. So to sum up about this Protagorean myth and how we're supposed to think about it, I think according to uh, Protagoras in Plato, it's a story about how social cooperation arises initially and how it's sustained over time. Um, and so it uses this important concept of shame that has been really central to lots of work, for example, like our friend E.R. Dodds in The Greeks and the Irrational um, and Bernard Williams in his critique of Dodds um, uh, in uh, Shame and Necessity. You see, I'm calling out my predecessors in this distinguished series. Um, uh, so um, uh, we get a story that is about shame at one's own injustice, reducing the subjective value of the injustice payoff, as we've said, and justice instills a willingness to pay the costs of punishing non-cooperators, those who act unjustly. And once again, there's lots of reason to believe this is true. Um, there's a body of experimental work summed up um, uh, in uh, Bowles and Gintis' Cooperative Species, it's on the bibliography, that suggests that the willingness of at least some individuals to pay, uh, to bear personal costs, um, that is to take risks, um, to lose something themselves in order to punish those who act unjustly, um, uh, is pretty common in human societies, um, and it, you can get to a stable equilibrium as long as you have enough of them. Um, so uh, then with a prevalent shame justice psychology, Pro uh, Protagoras cooperative community comes into being despite the initial presence of a few egoists, right? We assume that the distribution hasn't gotten to everybody, so there are these egoists. Cooperative behavior develops, becomes deeper and richer over time as cooperators learn to trust one another and as they punish non-cooperators, and the non-cooperators either learn or are expelled. Non-cooperators may reappear in the population. Once again, we assume that this can always happen. It doesn't assume that once you're clean, you stay clean, as it were, as a society. Um, uh, all right, um, but with learning and punishment, the cooperative society turns out to be robust to their periodic reemergence. They come back, we can deal with them when they come back. Uh, um, so conclusions, um, uh, oops, my, oh dear. This is what happened once before. Um, uh, the, uh, bear with me, um, uh, we've lost the, uh, uh, capacity for this uh, for it to advance. So simply have to try this and hope that this will reattach and otherwise. Okay. Um, this is going to have to be good enough, I guess. Um, uh, uh, no, still. Getting it. All right. All right. See if it will. All right. Um, all right. So, um, all right. Uh, so we'll just come to a okay, a general conclusion. Um, uh, that is, uh, Protagoras suggests that human motivations 
includes a weak moral sensibility. Um, uh, that is, instrumental rationality is tempered by our capacity to take the well-being of others as part of our own self-interest. So if we think about modern comparisons to this, um, we might think about the Gifts of Zeus story um, uh, as in some ways similar to forms of thinking about how moral psychology works with society. Um, for example, in the 18th century, um, Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments, or in the 20th century, um, John Rawls' uh, theory of justice. Now, Protagoras gives us a pretty thin conception of uh, a uh, moral sensibility. Um, the uh, stable human order um, uh, is not rich enough to get us um, to a Smithian or Rawlsian uh, society, sort of robustly and strongly um, just. But stable human order does rest, I think Procragoras suggests, on motivations that exceed bare egoistic self-interest. And that's important to both um, uh, Smith and to, and to Rawls. So the question then is, um, uh, Plato's Protagoras um, claimed that in a democratic society, because the story is specifically about a democratic society, um, all will rationally instruct each other, once again, because it's in our interest. Um, all will take, or enough of us will take responsibility for punishing violations, and that this can control egoistic self-interest. We can control those non-cooperators. Um, and so the question then um, uh, is that uh, uh, who's really right? Uh, Plato is considerably less sanguine about this, uh, or at least Plato of the Republic is considerably less sanguine. Maybe we should be saying Socrates, um, Plato's character. At any rate, um, the suggestion of the Republic is that stable social order requires a wise master set of technocrats and it also requires coercion, also deception. So the question is, was, was either of them right? right. Um, and I would just say that remains a question for us. Um, but I think thinking about that question is one reason um, to read Greek literature, and especially to read it um, in reference to some uh, contemporary work um, uh, in rational choice. Thank you.